could just minister to him and bring either his mom or other believers into his life. And then lastly, I pray for my brother Henry, Lord, and I do pray as this uh, prosthetic um, issue has been going on for quite a long time, pray that you would provide for him. I pray for this paperwork, and Lord, it can be so bogged down. Pray that you would speed things up and that you would bless Henry, Lord, with this, with this leg. And so, Father, I just lift all to you once again, thanking you for tonight, praying for our section of Scripture, that you would bless us through it. In Jesus' name, amen. Jeremiah chapter 30. Now, last week we saw the verse Jeremiah 29 11, which is very well known for I know now keep in mind this verse is written to God's people who are in Babylonian captivity it's people who are wondering why are we here what's going on and if they even really know why they are here because they do they understand their sins but they just never thought that it could come to this but God meets them and God gives them hope in the midst of those difficult days Again, for I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord. Thoughts of peace and not evil to give you a future and a hope. Well, what the Lord is going to be doing in the next four chapters, chapters 30 through 33, is building on that foundation of hope. He's going to start giving details and the things that he is going to do and how he is going to minister to his people and ultimately restore his people back into that land. And I can imagine at a certain point, it's, they're going to be wondering, how can this ever be turned back to how it was before? But as we know, well, we know historically it happened, but we also know with God, all things are possible. These chapters are almost, chapters 30 through 33, are almost a book unto themselves. Matter of fact, they have been referred to as the book of consolation. And really these chapters are God expanding upon that verse so that man would know the details of the hand of God. At the time of this writing, back in Judah, Jerusalem is under siege for the third time by Nebuchadnezzar. So keep in mind, Nebuchadnezzar has already come to Judah. Judah was able to make terms of peace, but Nebuchadnezzar took some of the best and the brightest, and that's when Daniel went back. And then Judah rebelled, and so Nebuchadnezzar came back and reconquered, took some more of the best and the brightest, and that's when Ezekiel was taken captive. And now they're under attack once again because under King Zedekiah, they have rebelled. So Jerusalem now is under siege, and so the people back in Babylon are hearing about this, and sooner or later, they're going to hear the destruction of Jerusalem in the temple and think that it's over for sure, but again... God, through his word, is giving them hope. So Jerusalem is under siege. The king of Judah, Zedekiah, is on the throne, but his days are numbered. And Jeremiah, at this time, he's been in prison for speaking God's truths, which the people simply did not want to hear. If you have an unpopular message, the people come up against the messenger, because especially in this case, they can't get at the one who is the origin of the message. And so it's during this dark and bleak time that God speaks to Jeremiah and gives direction. Some believe, and you'll see this later on in the study, that God delivered this through a dream. But regardless, it's still the word of God. Chapter 30, verse 1. The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Thus speaks the Lord God of Israel, saying, Write in a book for yourself all the words that I have spoken to you. For behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, that I will bring back from captivity my people, Israel and Judah, so the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom, says the Lord, and I will cause them to return to the land that I gave to their fathers, and they shall possess it. It shall be theirs. So in chapters 30 through 33 are meant to be a standalone message of hope. This would be hope for Israel as God is yet to fulfill the promises that he has given them, but pertinent to our lives as we look at these concepts that are written here, encouragement to the church that we would know that the same God who was gracious to Israel in their time of trouble is the same God who will be gracious to us in our times of trouble. So many times in the Old Testament, what we need to see isn't so much specifically the story, but the nature of God and how God interacts with his people and understand just as he interacted with them that particular way, he'll interact with us as well. So everyone who is held captive by sin, 
stupidity or situations, there's always hope. What I mean by stupidity, our own ideas, our own failures, or whatever it might be, there is always hope. There's always reason in Jesus Christ to be able to trust in God for our future. There's not a human being living alive right now that cannot put his trust in Christ today and have a glorious hope for their future. Regardless of what's going on, regardless of the situations and circumstances, God is greater than them all. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 8, it says, Therefore, he says, when he had ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. To, to, to lead captivity captive, it means those who were once yours, who have been taken captive, you are taking them back captive. You're taking them back unto themselves. And really, in Ephesians chapter 4, the idea is to all of humanity that has been taken captive by sin, the flesh, and the devil, Christ has come to bring them back to himself. Well, we see this illustrated here in Judah in the Babylonian captivity days and after. So in the books of our lives, God's always got a new chapter, and it is a chapter given to us by his grace, and it is kept permanent by his love. Verse 3 for behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, that I will bring back from captivity my people Israel and Judah, says the Lord, and I will cause them to return to the land that I gave to their fathers, and they shall possess it. We have here what is to be the theme of the next four chapters, how the captives' fortunes will be reversed, how the people are going to be united as one, united as one in their captivity, but also in their deliverance, and how they will be regathered together in the promised land. And so God isn't just, this isn't just going to be a spiritual thing. That I, This is a real tangible example of the grace of God and the fulfillment of the promises of God. So God's given these rich promises to Israel, and they're wondering, well, what's going on? It seems like it's over. Jerusalem is destroyed. The temple, at least, is going to be destroyed in just a little bit. And even in the midst of all that, God continues to give them promises. Because what he's trying to do, he's trying to build their faith for the day and the hope for tomorrow. Because he never wants them to fail, he never wants them to quit, and he never wants them to give up. Because he's never going to. He's never going to do those things in his life. So again, these things are happening that they can't understand, but what they're able to cling to is the promises of God. Because that's what's going to keep them for the next 70, 60 to 70 some years. And God's going to go before them, lead them back into the promised land. The temple's going to be reconstructed and then we know there's going to be the sending of the Lord Jesus Christ. So the first thing that we see here in chapter 30 is a promise. We see this in verses 4 through 11. So God is aware of their plight and will walk with them for their whole 70 years of captivity. Even though they're in captivity, even though, now again, if you're the Jewish mind, you're thinking, okay, the temple is over there, but we've been brought over here, and so God's over there, we're over here, but God's giving them that hope that he's with them wherever his people go. Even when we have been sent into the wilderness, never are we cast out from the presence of God. And so we understand that God is omnipresent, and my old religion told me that fact and that reality, and they was kind of the idea is you better not mess up, or if you sin, God's watching you. But it wasn't so much that. That's not the truth of the matter. The truth of the matter is God is omnipresent. He's always with you because he loves you and for the purpose of helping you, for the purpose of caring for you. Yeah, if you're going to sin and there's going to be repercussions of sin, sure, there's no doubt about that. But the purpose is God is everywhere is so that he would be able to take care of his children regardless of what is happening and going on in their lives. Psalm 139, verse 7, Where can I turn from your spirit or where can I flee from your presence? And the answer is nowhere. That's a section of scripture where King David's contemplating, if I go, and I'm paraphrasing, into outer space, behold, you're there. If I go to the deepest parts of the sea, you're there. In the early morning, you're there. In the dark, you're there. And he's going through all these things, and he's realizing God is forever with him. And so just as God did as he said historically, history books show us that these things have happened, we can see the pattern that he used in our lives, in their lives, biblically as well. And so we can notice the correlation between the biblical and the historical as we look at these verses. Look at verses 4 through 7. Now these are the words that the Lord spoke concerning Israel and Judah. For thus says the Lord, 
We have heard a voice of trembling, of fear, and not of peace. Ask now and see whether a man is ever in labor with child. So why do I see every man with his hands on his loins like a woman in labor? And so the idea is they're downtrodden, and this has happened, and they're mourning. Um, like a woman in labor, and all faces turn pale. Verse 7, alas, for the day is great, it's overwhelming, so that none is like it, and it is the time of Jacob's trouble, but he shall be saved out of it. Jacob is speaking of all of Israel. And so there's this great mourning, there's this great trial, there's this great tribulation, and once again, kind of go back to this concept of when you're going through a trial, it's a personal trial, and your personal trials will be overwhelming trials in your life. God uses them effectively, usually to bring you to the point of your dependency upon him. And there was the greatest trial of humanity that we experienced, that we were even worse off than these people were. And we're told in Romans chapter 5, verse 8, but God demonstrates his own love towards us, and that yet while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So yet while they still were in captivity, they were still suffering the effects of their sin, God is doing this great work of grace. Verses 8 through 9 for it shall come to pass in that day, says the Lord of hosts, that I will break this yoke from your neck and will burst your bonds. Foreigners shall no more enslave them, but they shall serve the Lord their God and David their king, whom I will raise up for them. And so there is that great future and a hope of what God is promising. Now, a lot of these promises are obviously they're going to have future effects upon the captives and the captives descendants and some of them will even extend through to the millennial age we can extrapolate through to that but in john chapter 8 verses 34 through 36 jesus answered them most surely i say to you whoever commits a sin or whoever commits sin is a slave to sin and a slave does not abide in his house forever but a son abides in forever therefore if the son makes you free you shall be free indeed well, that's exactly what he's talking about in verse 9. And they shall serve the Lord their God and David their king. Obviously, he's not speaking exactly of King David, but the descendant of King David. And we know it to be the promise of Messiah through the lineage of King David. Then verses 10 through 11. Therefore, do not fear, O my servant Jacob, says the Lord, nor be dismayed, O Israel, for behold, I will save you from afar and your seed from the land of their captivity. Jacob shall return and have rest and be quiet, and no one shall make him afraid. For I am with you, says the Lord, to save you, though I make a full end of all the nations where I have scattered you. Yet I will not make a complete end of you, but I will correct you in justice and not let you go altogether unpunished. So this is for a time and a season. He's going to display what he has said here as far as the nations being judged and that they're going to see Babylon fall to the Medes and the Persians. And they're going to understand as they're seeing all of these things happen that these things are playing out according to what God has said. And he speaks of their seed and your seed from the land of their captivity is speaking of their descendants who are going to go back and restore the land. In John 10, 27, 30, 10, chapter, verses 27 through 30, says, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. So although they're in Babylonian captivity, Babylon is the tool that God is using for their correction. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. In order to achieve these things, God will send his descendant of David, and that descendant of David, the Lord Jesus Christ, is the one who sets us free. We are under the effects of sin. For all of us, it was necessary to go through that time to understand the goodness and graciousness of God. We were being held captive by, again, the world, the flesh, and the devil. But then there came that day of our salvation that God set us free. And it's, he, he, he finished here, but I will correct you, the last part of verse 11, in justice and will not let you go altogether unpunished. So he's speaking of these great things of grace, but still there's a price to be paid. The scriptures tell us that God is just, and justice demands a price to be paid. My son-in-law, he hasn't 
in case anybody from the legal system is watching this. He hasn't spoken of this trial at all. I don't even really know what it is, but he's sitting on a jury right now. And it's a pretty serious thing, and there's multiple charges against this man. And I would imagine if somebody who's been accused of this, and let's just say justifiably so, you pray to the Lord and pray that the Lord would deliver you, and the Lord will meet you in the midst of where you're at, and you ask for forgiveness, the Lord will forgive you, but there's still going to be the necessity for justice. And it's what we see lacking in this nation. We have ignored justice in so many different arenas, and it's brought, it's brought dismay to our, really, to our society. So as the punishment is from God, so the restoration will be from God. And it works both ways. And so Israel, you're going to have to put in your seven. God's gracious. God's good. God's loving. But you're still going to have to do your 70 years. In Revelation 21.5, then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And so God is definitely doing a great work in Israel. Excuse me for a minute. I turned too many pages in my notes and I get lost. Okay, next what we see is a plight of a... Well, I always put page numbers at the top of my notes, and I didn't do it this time for some reason. You see the plight of a punished people in verses 12 through 17. For thus says the Lord, your affection is incurable, your wound is severe. There is no one to plead your cause that you may be bound up. You have no healing medicines. You can't do anything for yourselves. All of your lovers have forgotten you. And the idea here is, is the false gods and the other nations that they had associated with themselves, they were powerless against Babylon. They couldn't help them. They do not seek you, for I have wounded you with the wound of an enemy, with the chastisement of a cruel one, for the multitude of your iniquities, because your sins have increased. Why do you cry about your affliction? Your sorrow is incurable because of the multitude of your iniquities, because your sins have increased. I have done these things to you. Therefore, all those who devour you shall be devoured, and all your adversaries, every one of them, shall go into captivity. Those who plunder you shall become plunder, and all who prey upon you I will make a prey. For I will restore health to you and heal you of your wounds, says the Lord, because they called you an outcast, saying, This is Zion, and no one seeks her. And so... There's going to be that time again, but God is saying, that's my city, that's my mountain, and you are my people. And the world, the world will know that he is God. And so, again, I think I've mentioned it maybe last week or whatever, but one of the chief proofs that, for me, that has really spoken to me of the existence of God is the existence of Israel. When we go there, we're going to see, well, at times you're going to think you're in California. I mean, except for the traffic and the smog and all that other stuff, but especially like Central Cal, the San Joaquin Valley, you're going to see how fertile it is, and just the, 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 the groves that are there and the farming that is there, and you're going to eat of that food at night, of this fresh food, and you're just going to see how bountifully God has blessed. You're going to see how small Israel is, and you'll be to the northern border, to the southern border, and the eastern border, and the western border, and you'll get to see all that and understand the, the logistics of that country. If everything is as it was last time, you'll stand at the northern border, and you'll see Lebanon over there, and you'll see Syria over there, and you'll see how close they really are. You'll see how close um, Jordan is. Jordan is no longer an enemy of Israel, but they were. And it would be nothing for them to be lobbing missiles into Israel throughout pretty much the whole nation. But what has God done? Well, because we have the rich promises of God, he says that he is going to curse those who curse them and bless those who bless them. And he has done that. The existence of the nature, I'm sorry, the existence of Israel goes a long way of speaking of the existence of God. And it's just an amazing thing. Israel has been cast to the wind and then regathered together. And we just see this is something that God has done because never has that been done even once to any other nation or empire. And so we see this plight of this punished people. It is a real punishment. There's no doubt about it. But God still has great plans. Nobody else is able to do these things or cause these things to happen. 
but God has caused the wound to happen, but it's God who is going to heal up the wound. And then finishing out the chapter, we see God's pledge. Thus says the Lord, Behold, I will bring back the captivity of Jacob's tents and have mercy on his dwelling places. The city shall be built upon its own mound, and the, pla the palace shall remain according to its own plan. Then out of them shall proceed thanksgiving, and the voice of those who make merry. I will multiply them, and they shall not diminish. I will also glorify them, and they shall not be small. Their children also shall be as before, and their congregation shall be established before me, and I will punish all who oppress them. It's kind of interesting. The surrounding nations are all third world countries. Just pretty much all the countries other than Israel in that area are pretty much all third world countries. And the thing about it is, the other nations, they're the ones with the oil. But God has placed his blessings upon Israel. And it's not so much that I'm up here speaking this pro-Israel propaganda. I'm speaking pro-God propaganda because he's taken this, Deuteronomy chapter 7, he's taken this helpless nation and he has placed his glory upon it that the world would look upon it and see. And, and you need to look at it from a negative too. Why does the world hate Israel? Why is everybody so against Israel? Because the majority of the world is so against God. And again, they can't get to God, but they can get to the apple of his eye. And their Verse 20, And their children also shall be as before, and their congregation shall be established before me, and I will punish all who oppress them. Their nobles shall be from among them, and their governor shall come from their midst. Then I will cause him to draw near, and he shall approach me. For who is this who pledged his heart to approach me, says the Lord? You shall be my people, and I will be your God. Verse 23, and see the power of God to achieve this. Behold, the whirlwind of the Lord goes forth with fury, a continual whirlwind. It will fall violently on the head of the wicked. The fierce anger of the Lord will not return until he has done it, until he has performed the intents of his heart. In the latter days, you will consider it. You will see this come to pass. And so in verse 22, you shall be my people and I will be your God. I guess the implied question could be, well, what about the others? Well, that's when God speaks of his whirlwind of judgment. And so God does, and we will call it judgment, but it's not judgment that is happening to, to Israel during Jeremiah's day. It's correction. It's what we talked a little bit about on Sunday morning. Judgment is when God condemns a people. Judgment is final and judgment is forever. So I figure we're done early. We can go home early tonight. Or we can go into chapter 31, which we'll do. Chapter 31, verse 1. At the same time, says the Lord, I will be the God of all the families of Israel, and they shall be my people. And so the theme of God's future restoration of his people, it continues on. In this chapter, what God's going to speak of, we'll go through them pretty quickly, he's going to speak of seven blessings of a restored people. Seven blessings of a restored people, people who have experienced the grace of God. Now, we need to look at this as Israel, his people who have been restored, who have been brought back. We can look at it as a backslider, or we can just look at it as people, humanity that has been restored back to right standing with God. And so really what I want to look at is elements of somebody, maybe who walked away but now become aware of the goodness of God. And again, we look at these seven points and understand the magnitude of what God has done. But if you've never really gone on a serious backslide, just even the day of your salvation when God brought you into the kingdom, understand that these things apply to you as well. A little side note, God's restoration of humanity is through his word as we are as helpless as we saw Israel was back then. As those captives, they could do nothing in their situation. Well, the restoration that comes from God is, again, by the grace of God and definitely not by the power of man. We're told in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 18 through 19, knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. So again, salvation, restoration, it's all a work of the Lord. So one more thing before we start, a little test, just to make sure everybody's still awake. I want you to tell me what's the common phrase in the verses that I'm going to read, so you're going to have to be quick. So there's this 
thread that runs through these verses, and some of them, it's, it's there a couple of times. Verses, I'm just going to go through and read them, and you come up with the uh, phrase that's there. Verse 1, 4, 8, 9, 13, 14, 20, 27, 28, 31, 33, and 34. You're looking at me, Joanne. I didn't write it on my forehead. Does anybody see that that just two-word little phrase? There you go. Donna, you win. I will. Because again, this is all about what God is doing. Now, if you had the Pastor Mike version of the Bible, you'd already have it underlined. There's no such thing unless you rip mine off. And, but... I, I went through, and I, I, did, I don't remember when I've done it, but I, I had gone through, and I underlined all the I wills there. And so, again, you need to understand the weight that God is putting behind his promises. And so we today have the assurance, them back then, in the midst of their captivity, we understand if God says, I will, and, even if, and if he says, I will, whatever I read there about 12 times, and some of the verses have actually two of those phrases, God's going to do it. So the people in Babylon, as they receive this from Jeremiah, just think of the surety. Think of the hope that they would have. You need to understand that you've got that same hope today. So in chapter 31, we see seven blessings that God works in the life of restored people. And the first one is, is a renewed relationship. Verses 2 through 6. Thus says the Lord, the people who survived the sword found grace in the wilderness. He's talking about people who were not killed in uh, Jerusalem and though they've been taken captive have found grace there. Israel thrived in Babylonian captivity. Why? Because they were in the place that God wanted them to be. The people who survived the sword found grace in the wilderness. Israel, when I went to give him rest. Remember, they didn't give the land rest, so God had them send, spend the Sabbaths in, uh, in Babylon. The Lord has appeared of old to me, saying, Yes, I have loved you with an everlasting love. So with the same love that God exhibited when he brought them out of Egyptian captivity is the same love he still has for them as he brings them into Babylonian captivity. It's a love that is everlasting. It never stops. Therefore, with loving kindness, I have drawn you. And so again, this is all built upon an act of love. He says again, I will, speaks of future, I will build you and you shall be rebuilt, O virgin of Israel. <clears throat> you shall again be adorned with your tambourines. You shall go forth in the dances of those who rejoice. You shall yet plant vines on the mountains of Samaria and planters shall plant and eat them as ordinary food. For there shall be a day when the watchman will cry on Mount Ephraim, Arise and let us go up to Zion to the God or to the Lord our God. And so this is a pretty amazing thing because if you're of Judah and you're in Babylonian captivity, you're realizing this is extending much deeper. God's doing a much greater work than even just us. Uh, he's speaking even of northern Israel who was taken away by the Assyrians so long ago. There's no lost tribes of Israel. God knows those who are his. He's not just restoring Judah. He's restoring Israel. Not to back to what it was, but again, God's got a plan. Where was it that the Lord was born? It was in Bethlehem, but where did he live? And you'll see this if you're going to Israel. He was born in Nazareth, which is in the northern country. And so God's doing a work with all of his people. And so... <clears throat> We see this God who would give rest in Cana to those who would repent while in captivity, and they'll, refine, or they'll find that renewed love of God. Now, it's not renewed as far as God needing to renew it, but it's just the person who has been brought into captivity, been going through the trials, the person who's being restored understands that new magnitude or new awareness of the magnitude of the love of God. And so the hardest discipline... The hardest discipline would have been if God would have just not said anything. If God never spoke to the prophet or through the prophet, you know, when, when something bad is going on and you're not aware of all the details, how does your mind go? It goes through the roof. 
usually you're thinking of the absolute worst thing that could possibly happen, but God meets them there. He meets them there for the purpose of giving them peace. And so that being the case, you see, the, the hardest discipline would have been if, if God just brings you into captivity, if God just allows that trial or whatever and just ignores you. Matter of fact, what's a godless existence a picture of? It's a picture of hell. It's a picture of eternity that is without God in outer darkness. But always remember, when it comes to God's love for you, and this is a verse, I, I read it to the gentleman that I went and visited the other day, and I'll, I'll usually read it when I know I'm going to a born-again believer in a hospital situation, especially in a hospice. A hospice is a place that most people go to die. Some people in there pretty much have just been stuck in there with their family, or they don't have family. And if I, especially if I know that they're a believer, because I would imagine they're probably thinking, you know, what, what's going on? Why is this happening? Just for a reminder, and it's been given to all of us for a reminder, but in Romans chapter 8, verse 35 through 39, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? So all of those things, and you can add in your trial in the midst of it. As it is written, yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come nor height nor depth nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And that's actually Romans chapter 8, verse 35, and then 37 through 39. But the idea here is, is that what can separate us, born-again believers, he's writing to the church that is in Rome, what can separate you from the love of God? And I can whittle all these verses down to just a couple of words. One word, nothing. There's nothing that can separate you from the love of God. Because you notice how he ends it, or any other created thing. Well, he goes through all of this list, and really what I see here, and it's important that I understand, I can't even separate me from the love of God. God is always going to love me. As I said so many times before, I can never make God love me more than the day that his love was displayed to me on my salvation. That day when I came into his kingdom and I was no longer enmity with him, there's never going to be a day after that that he loves me any more than he did that day. But he will also maintain that magnitude of love throughout the rest, not just the rest of my life, but the rest of my existence. And so really, Romans chapter 8, verses 35 through 39, is one of the most, I, I don't know, you can't really say most powerful verses in the Bible, but to me they are. They're very profound and very assuring, and, and it doesn't matter what you have done. And, you know, obviously it's not given a license to anybody to sin or to forsake God, but I just see how great the love that God has for me. Because, again, it's not speaking of the love that I have for God. It's speaking of the love that God has for me. And, again, nothing can separate me from that. The prophet Zechariah was reminded of the concept of a renewed relationship when Israel came back into the land, but they weren't doing so well. In Zechariah chapter 1, verse 3, it says, Therefore say to them, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Return to me, says the Lord of hosts, and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. Again, if we're willing to start over with God, God is always willing to start over with us. If you look at verse 4, Again, I will build you, and you shall be rebuilt, O virgin of Israel. Earlier, he was calling him an adulterous wife. And the idea is God would consider this adulterous wife Israel at this point of repentance and restoration as if she was a chaste virgin, as if her sins never occurred. It speaks of the doctrine of justification. Secondly, if you have been restored, God is going to give you relief. Israel is the example, but God is sure and does not change. Just as the children of Israel are his children, we are his children as well. We see that God gives his restored children relief from distress. Look at verses 7 and 8. For thus says the Lord, Sing with gladness for Jacob and shout amongst the chief of the nations. Proclaim, proclaim give praise and say, O Lord, save your people, the remnant of Israel. Behold, and there it is again, I will bring them from the north country and gather them from the ends of the earth. 
among them the blind, the lame, the woman with child, and the one who labors with child together, a great throng shall return there. In God's system of merit, he works on his unmerited favor. And what I mean by that is, regardless of who you are or regardless of who you are not, regardless of what you're able to do or regardless of what you're unable to do, regardless of all of your perfections and regardless of all of your failures, none of that works for you, none of that works against you when it comes to God's grace. And so we have, we have Roberta over there, the most godly woman in the world. And I'm standing, <laughs> well, at least she's got a sense of humor. <laughs> she's standing there and I'm standing there and God, he, he loves us both the same. And, and God brings us both in because we both have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And it was by grace that we have been saved. It doesn't matter if she's more spiritual than I am. It, it doesn't matter how much of a failure I've been or, or vice versa, whatever it might be. God just, he, he brings those in. And that's what we're seeing here. He brings the imperfect in. He brings the outcasts of society in. He brings the people in who we may feel uncomfortable with and whatnot. You go to our convalescent home and you see the outcasts that are there. And again, some of those people have been set there just to, well, just waiting for the day of their death. You know, family has forsaken them or whatever. And those are the people that God loves and the people that God desires. And we need to understand that although somebody may be unpleasant in our sight, God loves them. Yet Romans chapter 8 applies to them just as surely as it applies to us. And we've got to understand how strong that is. Matthew 5, 3, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Next, we see a renewed person will experience consolation, verses 9 through 14. They shall come with weeping and with supplications. I, I will, I will lead them. I will cause them to walk by the rivers of waters in a straight way in which they shall not stumble. For I am a father to Israel, and Ephraim, Ephraim would be northern Israel, is my firstborn. Hear the word of the Lord, O nations, and declare it in the isles afar off, and say, He who scattered Israel will gather him and keep him as a shepherd does his flock. For the Lord has redeemed Jacob and ransomed him from the hand of one stronger than he. Therefore, they shall come and sing in the height of Zion, streaming to the goodness of the Lord. <clears throat> for wheat and new wine and oil, for the young of the flock and the herd, their souls shall be like a well-watered garden, and they shall sorrow no more at all. Then shall the virgin rejoice in the dance, and the young men and the old together. For I will turn the morning to joy, will comfort them, and make them rejoice rather than sorrow. I will stoutate the soul of the priest with abundance, and my people shall be satisfied with my goodness, says the Lord. <clears throat> Again, just breathing real hope into the brokenhearted. Anytime your faith is being tested, again, just see these rich promises of God and how God has fulfilled them to a degree. But understand, even in the future, as evil as things are getting, God is still going to protect. He's still going to fulfill them. Because, you know, again, how many times have we stated, you don't see the United States in the book of Revelation, but you see Israel. You see Israel because God's promises have been set upon Israel, and there's no work of mankind, no establishment of a nation, any other nation, that is going to take that focus away from God's chosen people. Now again, God's chosen people, why are they God's chosen people? They're God's chosen people because he has chosen to place his glory upon them. A Jew today still needs to be saved, still needs to come to faith in Jesus Christ. Next, we see a renewed person will understand the degree to which God responds to repentance, verses 15 through 20. Thus says the Lord, a voice was heard in Ramah, lamentation and bitter weeping, Rachel weeping for her children, refusing to be comforted for her children because they are no more. The idea here is, is a mourning and a repentance. Now, obviously, the scriptures come to fulfillment in Matthew chapter 2 when Herod was killing the babies, but the idea of this is an intense lamentation. Verse 16, thus says the Lord, refrain your voice from weeping and your eyes from tears, for your work shall be rewarded, says the Lord, and they shall come back from the land of the enemy. There is hope in your future, says the Lord, and your children should come back to their own border. I have surely heard Ephraim bemoaning himself, 
and have chastened, you have chastened me and I was chastened like an untrained bull. Restore me and I will return, for you are my you are the Lord, my God. Surely after my turning, I repented. And after I was instructed, I struck myself on the thigh. I was ashamed, yes, even humiliated, because I bore the reproach of my youth. Is Ephraim my dear son? Is he a pleasant child? For though I spoke against him, I earnestly remember him still. Therefore, my heart yearns for him. I will surely have mercy on him, says the Lord. So again, God has allowed his people to go into this time of correction, but never does he forsake him, forsake them. And we see the attitude of the people is that which is proper before the Lord during that time of correction. We have that spirit of sorrow. We have that spirit of repentance. It's that which we can never forget. It's the doctrines of the New Testament that have come into light, repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And then going on to verse 20, 21, verses 21 and 22, we see the road of return, how God has always kept it open. There's always this road back to being right with God. Now here we have it a little bit more physical in that the road to Babylon was always kept clear for Israel's return back to Judah. Verse 21, set up signposts and make landmarks. The idea is as you're going into captivity, Set up signposts and landmarks because you are going to be coming back this way. Set up signposts and make landmarks. Set your heart towards the highway, the way in which you went. Turn back, O virgin of Israel. Turn back to these your cities. How long will you gad about, O you backsliding daughter? For the Lord has created a new thing in the earth. A woman shall encompass a man. I saw that. I'm thinking, a woman shall encompass a man? I don't know exactly what that means because nobody really knows what it means. It's more than likely a reference to the Lord's coming. It just kind of makes sense in how it, how it fits there. But regardless, the idea is with God, there's always a way back to his good grace. Now, when I say way back to his good grace, we talked about this in our men's study a while ago. We have the grace of God that brings salvation, and I'm not going to go off into this. We don't have time. But there is the standing standing in the grace of God. Standing in the grace of God is that place when we're obedient to the Lord and the Lord blesses us. Right now, Judah is not standing in the grace of God. They're in captivity. They're going through the correction of God. And so God is saying, I always keep the way straight that you're able to come back through repentance and you're able to come back to that place of grace. That pathway is always clear. And the idea, as I've said so many times before, as long as man's able to draw breath, man's able to get right with God. Verses 23 through 30, we see a reunification. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, they shall again use this speech in the land of Judah and in the cities when I bring back their captivity. The Lord bless you, O home of justice and mountain of holiness, and there shall dwell in Judah itself and all its cities together, farmers and those going out with flocks. For I have stated the very soul... <clears throat> Excuse me. For I have stated the very soul, and I have replenished every sorrowful soul. After this, I awoke and looked around, and my sleep was sweet to me. So this verse 26 is almost parenthetical, and that's why some commentators believe that maybe this was delivered to Jeremiah in a dream. Maybe it's just that he just took time to meditate upon these things, and even in his sleep. Verse 27, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, that I will sow the house of Israel and the house of Judah with the seed of man and the seed of beasts. And it shall come to pass that as I have watched over them to pluck up, to break down, and to throw down, to destroy, to afflict, so I will watch over them to build and to plant, says the Lord. So he's saying these things are going to happen. In those days they shall say no more, the fathers have eaten sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge. The idea is children suffering because of the sins of the father. Verse 30, But everyone shall die for his own iniquity. Every man who eats the sour grapes, his teeth shall be set on edge. And then verse 31 to the end of the chapter, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant. I will. I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. We know this to be the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant which they broke, though I was a husband to them, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. So again, it's not going to be the superficial keeping of the law, but it's the heart that beats for the heart of the Lord. Verse 34, No more shall every man teach his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them, says the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and their sin, I will remember no more. Thus says the Lord, who gives the sun, so we're looking at the power of God now. Thus says the Lord, who gives the sun for a light by day and the ordinances of the moon and the stars for a light by night, who disturbs the sea and its waters roar, the Lord of hosts is his name. If those ordinances depart from before me, says the Lord, if these things don't happen, then the seed of Israel shall also cease from being a nation before me forever. Thus says the Lord, if heaven above can be measured and the foundations of the earth searched out beneath, I will also cast off all the seed of Israel for all that they have done, says the Lord. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, that the city shall be built for the Lord from the tower of Haniel to the corner gate. The surveyor's line shall again extend straight forward over the hill of Gareb, then it shall turn towards Goath, and the whole valley of the dead bodies and the ashes and all the fields as far as the brook Kedron to the corner of the horse gate towards the east shall be holy to the Lord. It shall not be plucked up or thrown down any more forever. So there's going to be times of trials and tribulations for Israel, but there's going to come that day. There's going to come the day of the restoration before them at that time, but we also know that God has future plans for Israel as well. We studied the book of Revelation. We see in Romans chapter 11, we see the great plans that God has for Israel. And so that's why God is so emphatic here with all of these I wills. It's that we look at these things and we notice through the trials and tribulations of Israel, remember, they cease to exist from 70 A.D. to 1948. But nonetheless, God brought them back, continues to bring them from the four corners of the earth. There's going to come a time in the future when great tribulation comes upon Israel again, and the Antichrist's venom is going to be turned against them. But God, once again, is still going to prevail. And we see this being played out, and it's for all generations that we see the glory of God of Israel. And what does that do? It strengthens our hope and the promises that we have the things that God has spoken to us and the surety of our salvation so that during the hard day, the evil day, our hope would be in him and nothing else. Father, once again, we just thank you, God, that you have given us these promises through your people, through your chosen people, Israel. And I pray, Father, that we would be a people who cling to the reality of these things. When we forget, I pray that we would be reminded of Israel's existence today. And we would understand, Lord, that it's only by your hand that they are there and maintained. But, Father, I also see that you have a future for them. There's going to come that time when the gospel goes out in a mighty way towards Israel, and many will be saved. And so, Father, we just thank you for your gracious intents towards them. We thank you for your gracious intents and thoughts towards us as well. And so, God, you're the one who is all-powerful. You're the one, Lord, who exhibits this great love. And you're the one who keeps us by that great love. I pray, Father, that we would be a people who walk in strength to your glory, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you all be standing, please? <clears throat> well, ten of us are going to be headed to Israel on Sunday morning. Um, you guys are stuck here, but we've, we've made plans for that. Um, on Sunday morning, uh, Melanie, Melanie did worship at one of the women's events, the Christmas woman event. She and her, basically her family now, are going to be coming out and they're going to be leading us in worship on Sunday morning. And then Charlie Campbell is going to be coming and he's going to be sharing with us on Sunday morning. The next Sunday, Art and Jose are going to be back out and they're going to share with us. And then um, Robert Baltadano will be teaching once again. And so the guys will be helping out in the midweeks and on Sunday night. And uh, I think you'll be in very good hands.
It's not about me or anybody else. It's all about the Lord and what the Lord does. God bless you guys. Thank you.